The scripture lesson for this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, 1 through 13. It's a parable of Jesus, and Jesus is telling us the story and, and its meaning. So Jesus also said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that when I'm removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, how much do, how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest master for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest within much. Then, if then, you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for you either, either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, help this to be a hearing time, a hearing time with worshipful hearing, and let it be followed by days of worshipful doing. So bless Jim as he preaches your word. By your Holy Spirit, make it come to life and make a home in our hearts so that we will use what we have that is not ours, but given to us from so many givers and by you, but help us to use these gifts in love for others and to give you joy. So bless the, this worship as it continues in our lives in Jim, in Jesus' name, amen. So my title for today's sermon is, Who Then is the Wise and Faithful Servant? In our study of the parables, we've seen that the kingdom of God has come to the world. The key to entering the kingdom is seen in how one responds to the message of Jesus. If people believe Jesus is the Son of God who came from heaven, the, the Lamb of God who was sent to come and die for our sins, then they also come to him for forgiveness. They repent and they seek to obey God and to trust in him. They are born again of water and the Holy Spirit. As the scriptures say, both Jew and and Gentile are sinners. Sinners who have been saved by grace through their faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself up for us. Jesus Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at the same time. He not only rose from the dead, 
but he also ascended into heaven where he is seated as both Lord and Christ at the right hand of God, his Father. We also learn that there will be a variety of responses to the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. Some people will hear, but they do not believe, and the word is snatched away from them by Satan. Some people will hear the message of Jesus and they'll receive it with joyfully, but because they have no root in themselves, they quickly fall away whenever there's persecution or tribulation arise. Others never mature in their faith. The word of God is choked in their lives because they're consumed with the cares of this world with the, and with the deceitfulness of riches, which choke out the word. There's only one group described as being fruitful. They are the good soil. They receive the word. They understand it and proceed to live out their lives in obedience to it. They bear fruit. The first, the fruit that God is looking for is described throughout Scripture as the righteous deeds of the saints. They're not the sinful deeds of the flesh, but the deeds carried out in the fruit of the Spirit. So this morning, I'm speaking to you who are seeking to allow God's Word to dwell in your hearts richly until you have been established in being wise and faithful servants. Like good, healthy plants, you bear fruit in season. So let's look at a few more teachings this morning about the kingdom, spoken to the servants of the kingdom, the sons and daughters of light. In Luke chapter 17, verses 7 to 10, we will start with, with to look at look at the, what the attitude is that we should have towards serving God. Jesus said this about a servant's attitude about serving. In chapter seventeen, verse seven, will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, "Come at once and recline at table." Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterwards you will eat and drink? Does he not thank the servant? Does he thank the servant because he did what he com was commanded to do? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. So I'd like to ask us this morning, what, what is, what was, or what then is our duty? What has the Lord given us according to our ability? Are we behaving with wisdom in how we're using our gifts and resources? Turn to Matthew chapter 25, if you have your Bibles open. And chapter 5, verses 14 to 30. This is a parable of the talents. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one, he gave five talents. To another, two. To another, one. Each according to their, his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five more talents. But he who had received the one talent went, no, he, um, and so also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. 
And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, he who also had two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. How have you have been faithful over a little? I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He who had all he also who had received the one talent came forward and saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But the man, master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sowed and gather where I have scattered no seed, then you ought to have invested my money with bankers. And my, at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take from him and take the one talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. For everyone who has will more be given. And he who has, he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless, worthless servant into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The key point I would like to focus on here is that every servant receives something according to their ability. Two of the servants used what the Lord had given to them and conducted business on his behalf. The last servant buried his talent and did nothing. He says he was afraid, but it's not clear afraid of what. It is not that he did not have ability or had no resources. He just did not want to use them to serve the master. He is called a worthless servant because he did not use what he had and set his heart to serve the Lord. He did not even try. There's one more parable that Jesus uses to teach his servants how they should be more shrewd in their dealings with the people of this generation. And it's found in Luke chapter 16, and so I'm reading for this morning. The parable of the dishonest manager or the shrewd manager. He also said to his disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought against him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors, one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe me, ma my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write down 80. 
The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of the, this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of the unrighteous wealth, so that when it fa fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is faithful in much. The one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. Then you who have been, you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This is a very problematic passage and has a very difficult interpretation. Commentators all agree that the difficulty with this passage rests in the recommendation of Jesus to learn from the dishonest steward. My professor at seminary called it the most perplexing of Jesus' parables. Why did Jesus praise one who squanders his master's possession and then legally cheats him out of his possessions? So before we dig into the passage, let me just say what it is not. <laughs> this parable is not an encouragement to be dishonest. <laughs> Nor is it, say, is it saying we sh will gain heaven or a place in heaven by better stewardship. Other scriptures make it clear that salvation is by grace through faith and not because of works. So it would be good to state right here at the outset what the parable appears to be all about. If you look carefully at verses in chapter 16, verses 8b through 9 and verses 10 through 13, they actually state what it is all about, what it is. By Jesus' own words, in verse 16, 9, the sons of light are encouraged to learn from the sons of the world and have more foresight and shrewdness to consider the outcome of their actions and use the world's goods in light of eternal values. To their own benefit eternally. The phrase... Sons of the light is only used here in Luke and again in John chapter 12, verses 35 and 36. So who are the sons of the light? Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. While you have the light, walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of the light. The sons of the light are those who have believed in Jesus. And they're walking in the light so they know where they are going. To the place God has prepared for them. They're not walking in darkness. But they may not be behaving very wisely with their minds set upon those heavenly things that God is preparing for him, for them in their, in their relations and behavior with those of the sun, uh, that are in this world. So for an expl explanation to the passage, we return and try to reconstruct the context in which Jesus taught the parable. First, we need to remember the Pharisees and scribes were also standing there listening to this parable. They were lovers of money. 
And there is a sharp contrast between the Pharisees and their worldly values and the, those values of the ones who have the values of the sons of light. So what are the values? The Pharisees were lovers of money. They boasted of their own piety and righteousness. And they separated themselves from all things unholy, but did not, they did it without love for God or for the lost. In their love of money, Jesus accuses them in chapter, in Luke in chapter 20, verses 45, saying, in the hearing of all the people, he said this to his disciples, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They receive the greater condemnation. In the Law, parable of the lost son or prodigal son. This prodigal son goes off to live it up in, in indulgent, sensuous living, wasting his father's goods. Hoarding, sensuous living, is a worldly value. It's demonstrated by collections of this and that, the rich and famous have so much accumulated that they often don't they often make it a hobby to collect art or jewels the great mansions of the lords of the british empire are examples of misplaced values these are people who have it have so much that they no longer know what to do with it the values of the sons of light, on the other hand, are to please their father in heaven. They are to love God and obey his word. His word, which teaches them to be compassionate for the, and, and for the poor and the needy, to use worldly goods to rescue the widows and orphans. So as servants, who are entrusted with the possessions of their master, what we have, we are to use to serve him and to extend his kingdom. They are his goods, not ours. And our attitude is to use them wisely, not to hoard them or to heap them up for ourselves or waste them on in extravagant living like the dishonest steward. It is not about bigger cars or bigger and better houses or more extravagant vacations. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 40 to 42, he says, If anyone would sue you, take your tunic and let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. I think when we look heavenly, we're reminded that someday we will leave it all behind. Our true treasures are in heaven, and we seek to please our heavenly Father as sons of the light. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We know that he has promised to meet all our needs. For he, he said, be not anxious about what you will eat or drink or what you will wear. But see, we see in this teaching to be content with what he has provided for us. Matthew chapter 6, 31 to 33. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek all after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the king, his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. 
So let's to return again to the interpretation of the parable and, the, and, and see how we can do that and study the, it in its own context. Let's take a look at verse 1 of the parable. It says, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought against him that this man was wasting his possession. The key words are he was accused of wasting his goods. In some words, the same words are also found in the parable of the prodigal son who squandered or wasted his goods on prostitutes. The word is actually diaskorpizon. It's a present active participle nominal, nominal, nominative masculine singular. And Loanida, the, the lexicon for Greek, defines it as squandering his goods on reckless living. The word that's tr translated as manager from Greek is okonomian. It is a manager of a household. This suggests that he is a person who has been given authority to look after the household and business affairs of a rich landowner. Huh? The manager has considerable legal powers to make transactions on behalf of his manager. It appears that he has been set over all the possessions of the master, but then he has been either lax in his duties or is accused of wasting his master's goods. Or like the prodigal son, he is indulgent and lives very well off them. Verse two, the master hears of this and goes to him and confronts him with the charges. He apparently doesn't deny the charges. So the master says, you can no longer be my manager. Turn in the account of your management. The master will need this account to know all that has been done with his property and to give the charge to another manager. It is also in the details of this account, he will see just how bad the steward has been cheating and if charges should be placed against him. Verse 3. The manager sees his predicament and says to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm no, not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg and I've decided what to do. I, I will... When I'm removed from my management, people may receive me into their houses. So you see in, in his thinking that he's very shrewd, looking for some way to rescue himself from his plight. So he summons his master's debtors one by one, and he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said, take your bill and write down quickly, write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said, take your bill and write down 80. The manager knows that the master cannot charge him without evidence and witnesses. He's been in charge of the master's goods and fields, probably let out to tenants. And many of those fields the tenants must pay a portion of the annual crop to the master, so they are indebted to him for the use of the fields. The tenants will know exactly how much was harvested and what portion belonged to the master. So he surely goes to each one independently so that they are in, there are no witnesses. And as, the man, as a manager, he still has authority to make legal translation, transactions on behalf of the minister. And he secures more agreements in the handwriting of each debtor and reduces their debt to the master. Each debtor 
will be greatly pleased with his generosity. So much so, when he is relieved of his duties, they will be willing to welcome him into their, their homes because of the great amount of money he has saved them. Looking at the amounts of the debts, it looks as if the master has at least a very large olive tree plantation and a wheat field 25 times larger than the average family farm. An olive field of about 146 trees producing 875 gallons of oil. Once the original debts, bills of debt are destroyed, the new ones written, the master will have no proof to convict him of fraud, and he will have friends that he's made with each of his debtors. By his shrewdness, he has provided for himself for some time to come. Jesus completes the parable by saying that when the master finds out what he has done, he commends the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. And then he concludes, the sons of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their generation than the sons of the light. I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of the unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. Now consider this. If the sons of the light are to make friends with the people of the, this generation, and as a result, those same people will receive the sons of light into their eternal dwellings, it suggests that the sons of light have used the unrighteous wealth of this world in order to influence the people of this generation to believe in Jesus. The Pharisees and the principal, the disciples are warned that we are not here on this earth for the accumulation of great wealth. Those who are the sons of the light have the opportunity to use the goods entrusted to us for eternal purposes, by using money to make friends, possibly lead them to Jesus, we invest in eternity. There will be those who enter the kingdom, and there, will, and there they will welcome us because of the influence we had to bring them into the kingdom. Those who, who wastefully use their master's goods miss out on the opportunity and fail to act shrewdly with foresight, with a value toward eternity. The kingdom values focus are not on selfish gain, indulgence, personal glory, power, riches, but on seeking to worship the true God and serve him. We have the opportunity now to use the skills we have and our resources in, to offer the good news to the people of the world. When the good news fails, or falls on good soil, we will be bringing, we will be helping to bring people into God's eternal kingdom. So, what can we say, Master? You have delivered me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. And this master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will give, set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. We know that we leave the worldly goods behind when this life ends. But we have the opportunity now to invest in eternity. The only thing that I know remains forever from this world are the souls of men and women and the word of God. We cannot serve two masters. We are not, to, not in this world to accumulate a big retirement, I speak to myself, or to great 
or great wealth to pass on to our children. We're here to serve God and extend his kingdom in this world. Do not let the cares of the world or the deceitfulness of riches choke the word of God from bearing fruit in your lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we worship you this morning and we lift up our hearts, remembering that we are just unworthy servants. We're only seeking to do our duty. At the same time, Lord, help us to look up, to remember where we are and where we are going and what you prepared for us and that this is a temporary sojourn here on this earth in which we have a short time to use what you've entrusted to us. First, we look at the, the um, worldly goods, but more than the worldly goods, what are the messages and what are the information, what are the things of the kingdom, the spiritual goods that you've entrusted to us that we can share with others. Help us to make the most of the gifts, the spiritual gifts, to make the most of the resources that we are entrusted with to enlarge your kingdom, to make an impact here in Mattawa, so that the world might hear the good news of Jesus Christ and come to you. We pray this this morning, that you bless this message to our hearts and our lives, that we might live fruitful lives as we serve you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final song this morning is this, a song of worship to the Lord of the sea and sky, the great creator of heaven and earth, the one, our master whom we serve. And to just a, a short introduction to the song, it's from First Chronicles 16, verse 31 to 36. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea roar in all that fills it. Let the field exult in everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Say also, save us, O God of our salvation. Gather and deliver us from our, among the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name. Glory. In your praise, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen.